but I have to say that like hostels have gotten a bit pricey like really have it's it's not as budget friendly backpacker friendly as it used to be which makes me really sad because you know like I think it was it was such a benefit for people who really wanted to travel on a budget and had that opportunity and so I honestly I just really love traveling like with my partner and other friends and it's kind of one of the beautiful things about this lifestyle is you end up making friends in a lot of different countries so I truly have friends like across the world in all these different time zones and the universe just kind of gave me a little bit of a helping hand actually and had some brands reach out to me and wanted me to shoot content for them and they're like hey would you like to come and like write a review for us on your website it's a great big world out there and there are some incredible incredible people, amazing cultures, fantastic experiences. Welcome to the Winging It Travel podcast with me, James Hammond, where every Monday I'll be joined by a guest to talk about their travel stories, travel tips, backpacking advice, and so much more. Right now, I'm taking the podcast on the road traveling with me. So tune in every week for short form episodes detailing all my travels alongside my Monday guest episode. Are you a backpacker, traveller, gap year student or simply someone who loves to travel? Then this is the podcast for you. This is a casual, informative podcast designed for you to inspire you to travel. There'll be stories to tell, tips to share and experiences to inspire. Welcome to the show. Let's get into the episode. Hello and welcome to this week's episode where I'm joined by Brianna West, who is a sustainable travel blogger, digital nomad coach and a content creator. Brie runs the travel brand Travel Munchers and likes to focus on sustainable travel and digital nomad life. Today, we're gonna talk about all of that and of course, some travel. Brie, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm great, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, look forward to this chat. So tell listeners, where in the world are you based right now? And we'll go into some backstory in a bit. Okay, cool. Um, Right now, I'm actually in Austria. So uh, Austria has been kind of my hub or my base for the last seven years. You know, I, obviously I'm American, so, you know, home home is the States, but Austria has kind of been my second home and this is kind of our return to spot. Okay. And is there any reason for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I moved over here seven years ago actually to get my master's degree, which is how I ended up in Austria originally. I loved Europe. I didn't really feel like going back. So I found a way to stay. And then (laughs) I met my partner and um, he's actually a professional hockey player. So I kind of move around with him for the season. And then we travel during off season or I travel during his season when he's busy. Um, But his parents actually are also based in Austria. They're Hungarian, but they live just outside of Vienna. So it's, it's kind of like our second hub with his side of the family. So do you base yourself in one city normally? So we've had an apartment in Vienna for the last few years. Uh, We no longer have it, actually. So we are technically, I like to call it, you know, like happily homeless. Yeah, Um, (laughs) Yeah. tell me about it, yeah. (laughs) Um, So um, I think like getting into the lifestyle, I really needed that home base and like a place to return to. And um, I think down the road, I'll, I'll want it back. But, you know, like with his hockey season, we're usually in a place for anywhere between eight to nine months in the year. Then we go back to the States and visit my parents for a month. Then we're back in Europe for another month. And then we're traveling the rest of the year. So it kind of like is there was really no point in having a apartment anymore. So that's kind of how we decided to give it up. But, you know, between the States and Austria, we still have bases with our family that we can always return to. Got it. I'll come to more details about how you do that later. But first, let's talk about US. So you grew up there. So you can tell listeners, whereabouts in US did you grow up? Um, I grew up in South Carolina. So um, I was actually born in Georgia, but we moved when I was about two. So South Carolina has always been home for me. However, both of my parents are from Michigan and my whole family's up in Michigan. So uh, we did an annual trek up there yeah. when I was younger. So that was kind of our big trip of the year that we tended to do and sometimes we did it twice a year but um yeah so South Carolina is really home and that's where I still go home to now okay and just for my listeners who are not U.S. based whereabouts in the U.S. is that southeast uh so right above Florida and Georgia like right on the bottom part and you have a coastline right a little bit of coastline oh yeah yeah oh yeah okay Charleston Charleston yeah yep and my aunt lives in Charleston actually so it's great well apparently it's supposed to be 
one of the nicest places to visit in the US. It's beautiful. Like it is, it's an absolutely lovely, lovely place. So, I mean, I've been really fortunate that I've had, you know, my aunt living there for so many years. So mm. I was able to always go visit her and stay with her and get down there at least once a year as well. So yeah, I highly, highly recommend Charleston. Nice. Okay. That is on my list, actually. I've had two or three people mention that on the podcast so far. <laughs> yeah. And I've got some listeners from there as well. So yeah, place to go. Okay. So I'd like to delve into like travel, where did it come into your lives? Early doors, did you always know or were you interested in travel or was there a trip that maybe ignited the passion or was it a slow burner throughout like, maybe adulthood? Um, I think I was always really interested in it and I wanted to do it a lot. However, I was in a ton of different sports growing up. So most of my travel was actually, you know, kind of based and surrounded off of trips for that. Um, it it was, you know, year long and from one sport to the next type season. So I didn't Mm -hmm. have a lot of free times and we didn't do a whole lot of traveling internationally as a family or anything, but I remember my parents going on a few trips for, you know, like anniversaries or something like that to like beautiful places. And I was just like, wow, I can't wait to go there one day. So yeah, I didn't really get to travel internationally much as a kid, but like, it was something I knew I always wanted to do. In university, uh, I worked really hard and I actually graduated early and I really wanted to take a year off because I could not study abroad as someone who was on an athletic scholarship. You weren't allowed to take the Uh, year to travel. Yeah, it was unfortunate. I really wanted to do it, but um, we were in training year round. So it's kind of the same thing. Sports always always took up most of the year, Um, but I wanted to take a year abroad before doing my master's degree and my parents love them but they were like uh, no get a job <laughs> oh okay <laughs> <laughs> so I, I ended up working for a year like in my college town and then I applied for my master's abroad got accepted and the next thing I know I'm on a plane to Austria and it's been over seven years now so they they may be slightly regretting not letting me take that one year because it's turned into seven now with no end in sight um, mm. but for me it's worked out great yeah, they tend to work out in the end. It's yeah, weird how exactly. these decisions, the quirks, like them saying no, now you're here. Like if they said yes, you might be somewhere different now. Like it's, you can't really I, analyze yeah. it. Yeah. I have no idea. Maybe to be fair, like maybe I wouldn't have come back though. So I, I think mm. it probably worked out for the best. You know, I still got my degree. I still got the experience. And then I had the freedom to kind of choose to stay over in Europe. Nice. Applying in, in Austria for your master's, did you apply to other countries in Europe? Um, no. So I actually had visited Austria when I was 14. It was the first like really big international trip that I did. I actually attended the Junior Olympics, uh, oh, wow. part of the yeah, part of the People to People Sports Ambassadors program um, is how I got my foot in the door with it. So I actually came to Vienna, Austria for that when I was 14, 15. And uh, I had learned a little bit of German. I will tell you right now, it's not the same German, but you know, I was really <laughs> confident about the fact that when I had been here too, I'd really liked the city and three, I thought I knew the language. So it just made sense. Um, my studies were in English, so it wasn't, you know, going to be overwhelming or anything, but mm-hmm. at least it, it just made sense. And it also was like a really strong program. I mean, I don't know how many people know, but you know, like psychology, Sigmund Freud and Vienna is a really big thing. So it was a strong program and it was just something I was really interested into. And yeah, so I think I just got really lucky that I was like, nope, I'm applying to this one and I got accepted and I'm on a plane. (laughs) Wow. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to have to ask sport wise, what sports did you do? Um, so volleyball was what I played actually all through university and then high school. I actually started really late with that. I played basketball. I did track and field. I had done martial arts I rode horses for a really long time I played soccer when I was younger kind of all over the place to be honest right so sporty type (laughs) yeah yeah I think America has one of the best places to do like all these different sports like for me it's just football or soccer as you say that's it if I was playing rugby I wasn't in the right school so it wasn't possible um, yeah, I, I would US, say I think you definitely have that advantage where like you just have the opportunity to try out a lot of different things yeah. and you know, you're exposed to a lot. So yeah, I, I was really fortunate that way. Okay, so you got into Austria. That's great. Did you then start to maybe plan to travel outside of your studies? So maybe like Europe or 
during university or your master's degree, did you plan to maybe start to think, okay, maybe long term or you know, going for a longer period of time? Did that come into your mind? So originally it was going to just be the first two years, but I knew I wanted to travel as much as I could during those mm. two years. So uh, we were really lucky that our classes were kind of, you know, nicely scheduled throughout the week and we could have long weekends. And um, when I actually first got into the program, one of the last semesters was actually something you could do completely remote. Sadly, it did change by the time I got <laughs> to that semester. But um, yeah, we, we made the most of it. You know, we had longer breaks. We had long weekends. And um, a lot of the people that I was studying with or friends that I met had family in a lot of countries around here as well. So that was always really beneficial. You know, we could hop over to Germany or Scotland or Italy or something with friends who had family there. Nice. That's kind of the dream, really, isn't it? If you've got fr- it, like, yeah, friends or family, <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> yeah it was it was the broke college kids way to do it for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah because you need that accommodation that's what I've learned uh-huh. do you know weirdly enough I'm on my trip now and I've not really backpacked Europe I've been to places like France and Germany just because the weekend trips from UK but you know backpacking and I'm just shocked by how much accommodation costs I'm now in Switzerland and I am shocked at how expensive it is Switzerland's pretty expensive (laughs) yeah yeah you can say that again yeah (laughs) yeah yeah I I've been there a few times and uh two of the times I I stayed with a friend's family thankfully but even those trips were still you know like the few times we went out or ended activities or went out to eat or something it was it was burning a hole in the pocket so I, I couldn't imagine having stayed longer and not stayed with friends Yep, we're here for five nights, maybe six. Oh god, yeah. We paid for a hostel, like twin bedroom, with our own bathroom, so it's not too bad. But that per night costs much more than our last accommodation in Luxembourg, which is like this posh hotel. Um, just because there's not much accommodation in Luxembourg. And the difference in price is quite big, but the difference in the quality of the room is huge. It's oh of crazy. course, of course. But I have to say that like hostels have gotten a bit pricey, like they have yeah yeah they, yeah they really have it's it's not as budget friendly backpacker friendly as it used to be which makes me really sad because you know like I think it was it was such a benefit for people who really wanted to travel on a budget and had that opportunity and I fully understand that travel is a privilege so like it just it makes me really sad to see mm. that you know it's becoming harder and harder for people to travel on a budget not that you still can't do it I mean I talk about budget travel all the time and mm. talk about you know like tips and tricks and hacks and stuff so I'm still out there trying to fight for that but it does make me sad to see how expensive some hostels have gotten yeah that's a great point actually I I do want to touch on that because I was looking at hostels and I just couldn't believe I went to Rome last week and I couldn't believe that bed in a dorm is like 40 50 euros in some place I'm like what that used to be the price for private rooms yeah yeah what's happened Mm -hmm. I know I know (laughs) I'm shocked you are right it's a valid point I, I don't think especially in Europe traveling in hostels is budget friendly anymore it is to a point but not as much as it used to be honestly like I mean I know Airbnb has a lot of problems but we we tend to try to look at Airbnb for the most part because I mean it's just like security issues and stuff as well but in the long run they're not that much more expensive and you just get like you know an entire residence or like a private room or something at least and you know it's back to that price for quality and the quality is just so much better even though it is still a bit more expensive but like the differences aren't as drastic you're not saving as much anymore yeah I almost feel like they're charging it an excuse would be well you get to meet people that should be a given but -hmm. you should be able to pay a fair price for a bed in a dorm irrespective of anything else but the fact that it's now in Europe, anyway, 30, 40, 50 euros is, yeah. is crazy. And I mean, I'm also not someone who's a huge partier or a nightlife person. Okay. So, you know, like having a ton of people being really loud at night is actually not something that I'm interested in. Yeah. You know, like I like I'd rather choose the nights that I want to go out and pick my locations and meet people that way. I mean, yeah. I'm a very social person. So like I'll go talk to people and make friends on my own. That's not a problem. But, you know, like that party vibe is just not something I can do so if we are looking at hostels I really try to look for ones that are you know not advertised as like party hostels yes yeah same we are the same I don't mind meeting people and having a few drinks but 
yeah the party hostels I I just value my sleep much more these days oh 100 <laughs> percent. I'm 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 like the day adventure like let's do yes. excursions and trips early. during the day together let's yeah. come back and have like dinner and drinks and then I'll go to bed at a reasonable hour exactly the same <laughs> we're on the same page I like it <laughs> my partner hates me for it he is such a partier and he's had to oh really oh yeah he oh is. wow he loves it he loves it but I'm usually like okay well mm. I'm gonna go to bed <laughs> <laughs> yeah I just think there's such good value getting up early and getting out there for the whole day. I think it's better value. And, and I also just think the earlier you're out there, like the less people, you know, yeah. I mean, I get those early mornings can be tough, but having those couple of hours where it's just not jam packed and you have places to yourself and you get a fresh start and you really utilize the part where I have energy during the day, at least. Mm. I just, I think that that's just highly, highly outweighs having a late party night. True. And the next day after that, I mean, unless you're young yep. <laughs> uh, and you're good with hangovers, you're going to be kind of ruling a day out. Well, I would anyway, if I've had a lot to drink. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's another thing is he's just, he's, he's immune to hangovers still. Immune? So. Dream. He really is. It's annoying. <laughs> yeah. Crikey. I can't deal with no sleep. Oh. Anyway, let's not go there. <laughs> right, but we're going to go into sort of the traveling, backpacking life um, because I want to know more about your travels and your nomad life and also sustainable travel. So I've got some questions lined up here. Uh, but you mentioned in your bio on your website that you love meeting new people and cultures. Where did that kind of come from, do you think? I always have to like preface this with, I don't mean any you know negative connotations when I talk about this, but mm -hmm. I kind of come from one of those stereotypical Southern towns where everyone marries their high school sweetheart and then you know moves into a house a town over and is probably on their like third or fourth kid at the moment. Crikey. <laughs> yeah. So like, and I mean, like I get it, like for some people that's amazing. Like that's yeah. what they want out of life. And I'm so happy that they, they got that, but that was just something that never resonated with me. And, you know, I had always wanted to travel and I would always kind of been like, there's a huge world out there. I want to see it. Mm -hmm. And it was funny. Cause like all of my friends back then even were like, Oh, like you're going to get out. Like you are definitely not going to stay here. So like, it wasn't, a new or shocking thing by any means but I think that it was just I really wanted to immerse myself with people who have different ideas and different opinions yeah. and different thoughts because like when you grow up in a smaller town of course people are going to have their differences but a lot of them have to, tend to have a lot of similar ideas and values and stuff and I just think it's really important for someone to be able to truly develop their own beliefs and for that you really need to be open to a lot of different perspectives and I think experiencing it for yourself is the only way you're really going to know like what you believe. Yeah. And so for me, like meeting new people from different places was just always so fascinating and interesting. And I always wanted to talk to them about so many things and, you know, hear their opinions or their perspectives on things so I could actually better form my own, um, you know, and I just I think it's really amazing to meet people who have extremely different cultural backgrounds and see what life is like for them, because you know, you grow up with yours and you kind of think this is the norm, but it's yeah. really not for so many people out there. And it's just really, really like eye opening. It's the only way to learn, I think, to speak to people mm -hmm. like that. I, I agree. Because if you don't, how do you know that yours is the best way or the only way? You'll never know. Um, but then I guess flip that around. Someone could say, well, you, but, you, but you're never going to visit every culture, which, you know, I get that. That's a fair point. But surely you'd rather have 50 cultures under your belt than just one. Yeah. Well, and I mean, and at the end of the day, if you still believe, you know, what you grew up believing, then like more power to you, but like yeah. you've really solidified that belief. So like now you're not going to have any doubts about it, you know? Yeah. And do you struggle to maybe like connect with those people if you still speak to them in your town? Because what I found where I'm from, you know, a lot of my friends don't travel and it's hard to relate sometimes because they're on a, such a different path of, I mean, you said kids and, you know, marriage and house and all that sort of stuff. Totally different. Uh, and it's hard to relate to each other's lifestyles. Do you find that a problem at all? Or? Um, I think I was really fortunate that there are a couple of families that I grew up with, you know, since preschool and kindergarten. And like the kids were basically my like pseudo siblings. Mm -hmm. And I still absolutely love seeing them and talking to them and watching their lives unfold. You know, like almost all of them are now married. Most of them have kids. A few, like maybe one or two are still single. But like, you know, so it's it's definitely different because our lives are in such different states. But I think I'm really fortunate that that small group of people 
has just been, you know, like they've been there my whole life. So we can be really happy for each other, even though we're on completely different paths. But, you know, like seeing them and stuff, I don't feel out of place or anything like that. You know, like I'm excited to hear about their lives. I'm excited to catch up with them. They're always wanting to hear about my life and travels. And, you know, so I'm really fortunate that like that small community of families that have been around my whole life are still in my life. You know, like my parents and their parents are all friends. And like, we literally just watched each other grow up from preschool onward. Um, But outside of that group, honestly, I don't think I kept in touch with anybody Mm. else from town or high school. You know, I kind of have been an independent person. And I I feel, you know, as I get older, that's not always a good thing. I mean, it's, it's (laughs) definitely had its benefits, but like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of sensing that, I do kind of wish I had some of those stronger connections sometimes and, mm. you know, those people who were there all the time, but right now in this lifestyle, it's just, it's really hard to, you know, have those really strong friendships when you're constantly moving and you're not around each other all the time. So I, I just try to look at it as, you know, I do have that small community that I grew up with and I'm very fortunate that even though we don't talk all the time and even though I don't see them very often, when we go home, we just kind of pick up where we left off yeah, and we great. catch up with each other. And we both understand that, you know, like we're on different paths, but we can kind of like go together still. Yeah, you're totally right. I'm glad you have that connections because some people don't have those connections actually when they leave to go traveling because everyone is like, you know, staying at home, which kind of leads me to the next question. When you were growing up and you said that people, you know, stay in the same town, which is absolutely fair enough. Is even going to, like, to another U.S. state, is that even a big thing, do you think? Honestly, like, the the few people that I've kept up with on social media that I, like, grew up with, they're, they're still, like, in our hometown, you know, or they're wow. still, like, a little bit away. I, I don't know that many of them that have moved to even different states. Like, obviously, there <laughs> have been. Yeah. Like, of course, there have been. And there's a handful, maybe, that I can think of off the top of my head. But I think we just had, like, a high school reunion recently. And oh, okay there were quite a few people that went and like, I mean, a lot of people didn't go, but I know they're still living in town. So it was just, it was Mm. really, yeah. So I I honestly think the majority of people, at least that I talked to and socialized with and, you know, were kind of my cohort, a lot of them actually still live like in our state, if not, you know, within an hour or two away. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Cause someone said to me who's American that even traveling to another state is quite a big thing to do you know, let alone internationally, like off the scale, if in South Carolina, going to New York state, for example, might be quite a big trip. Oh, well, and to be fair, it is like people don't understand, like over here, that's the same as, you know, going from, let's say, France to Norway, maybe, maybe. Yeah, you know, so like people always are like, oh, they're kind of staying in the States, but like, you do have to give some perspective that the states is massive. Huge. So so yeah. moving from those states is actually still a really big jump. Like, Sure, it's still the same country. A lot of the logistics that you deal with moving internationally aren't going to have those same obstacles. Mm -hmm. But like, you're still moving just as far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, from one coast to the other coast is, it's pretty far. (laughs) (laughs) The US is huge, diverse. It's a trip in itself, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, what a place. Okay, we're gonna go to some of your travels next. Uh, So I've got like, ask me three maybe countries that you like to recall from your travels previously so country one is indonesia and you put hands down <laughs> hands down, down. <laughs> like i i'd move there tomorrow if i could like i'm just i'm eager to go back i absolutely love everything about southeast asia honestly so yeah. it's not just indonesia but indonesia was just my absolute favorite um, I got to go over to Bali to see a friend that I met in university who's from New Zealand and mm-hmm. catch up with him. Um, we went to like an elephant sanctuary and anybody who knows me is like, that's, that's my spirit animal. My like true love in life is an elephant. Best day of my life. But you know, it was just gorgeous. You have the mountains, the jungles, the beaches. You can stay in these luxury villas for the price of a hostel. In yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, no. like the, the food <laughs> is incredible. And again, yeah. it's like it's the same as paying for like a drink or an appetizer over here in Europe. And like the people just so friendly, so welcoming, so helpful. And I just I also just loved the culture, you know, like learning about it and seeing some of like the more traditional sides. There was nothing about it that I didn't love. You know, um, I have to say that my friends got food poisoning. So they probably Standard. had 
a few bad days <laughs> and I was really lucky not to get it. Um, to be fair, they ate sushi at a place that some people said don't eat at. Mm. They took the risk and they lost. Yeah, it's a risk or take. Yeah, um, but you know, I, that was the only time that like I did a solo trip over over there for the two days that they were sick. So I was kind of going around by myself and I felt fine, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, it was one of the first times I'd kind of ventured out by myself and everyone was just so nice yeah I just I don't have a bad thing to say about it did you venture to any other islands apart from Bali uh no I was so sad I was actually I met some photographers and videographers and they invited me to do a shoot but it was the day of my friend's cousin's wedding uh so I was going to try to meet up with them and then I was like no like it's the day of the wedding and then that's the day everybody got sick oh (laughs) so yeah yeah, um, I ended up being free, but then by that point, I was just like, oh, I'm not going to like try to go catch up with people and stuff like that. So sadly, I didn't. So that's what that's another reason Like, I'm dying to get back there so mm. I can explore a lot of the islands because I've got a ton of them on my list. Yeah, I've only been to Bali too, and controversial. I didn't like Bali that much, but I'm <gasps> desperate to go to other places. Yeah, yeah. Um, all the other islands Which in Indonesia. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't a fan, but... You know, people got different stories, that's fine. But I want to go to like Lombok and then Flores and mm-hmm. Java as well. I want to see all these other places. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm hands down ready to go back anytime. Yeah. Huge country as well though. Huge. There's a lot of places to explore there and fairly cheap. Yeah. Okay. Country two, UAE. This past summer, my partner and I went to Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Yeah. And we had a great time again this is kind of to do with you know where i come from but a lot of people were just like we can't believe you're gonna go to the middle east oh why not well and this is the thing is i was like there's so many amazing things there like you know and i had the most weird reaction because i'm going to lebanon and people said you're going there i'm like yeah like it's dangerous i'm like well is it though (laughs) you you might read it's dangerous but is it i'm not sure I'll, i'll go and find out myself so yeah it's crazy and I, and I understand, and like, I get that, you know, for certain countries, there may be other warnings and stuff, but I know so many people that go and just have these amazing trips, and I just got so frustrated, you know, there's still countries that when I tell my parents that I want to go to, they're just like, they get so upset, and mm. we get into arguments and stuff, so like, I've held off going, because I don't want to upset them, I don't want to disappoint them, but you know, in the last few years, I just kind of started getting to a point where I was like, it's just not fair because like we see what's in the media, but we don't really know what's going on. And there's always two sides to it. And as long as you travel smart, as long as you are respectful, like chances are you're going to be fine. And honestly, yeah. every country is dangerous. Like our apartment yeah. in Vienna got broken into while we were gone last Christmas. Like oh. Vienna, the safest country, like safest city in one of the safest countries in the world. And we had our apartment broken into. So like, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, like it can happen anywhere. And this was our first trip to the Middle East. And I would love to go back again. People were so nice. Um, I think it was just like, it was another really kind of diverse place that I Mm. hadn't been to, which is why I was so excited by it because I really loved you know, like, that's why I think why I loved Indonesia, because it was the first one that I went to in Southeast Asia. And it was the first really in most like immersive experience with this culture. So I was really excited to see something so drastically different mm. from the world that I grew up in. You know, I mean, Europe, don't get me wrong, tons of cultures, tons of different things, but mm. it's still relatable to where it's kind of westernized. And yep. so for me going, you know, to the Middle East and Southeast Asia, like it's a whole new world. And I think that's where like, I just truly get excited. Yeah, same as me, new cultures, new countries. I want to test myself in these places. And um, any tips for me, because I'm going to UAE in after Lebanon, and I've never been. So was there like one thing that you did that you could recommend? Oh, I have blog posts on it, my friend. I oh, will send you okay. tons of it. I have, yeah. I have guides, <laughs> like I got all of it. I will I will Lovely. definitely hook you up. Oh yeah. Um I would just say that, you know, like be really respectful of the culture. So we were told, you know, especially for women, there's certain dress codes you should follow yeah. and you know, like modest interactions between men and women and you know, respect at certain places that like men and women aren't allowed to touch or stuff like that. Just kind of be wary of that. But overall, like they're so friendly and it was beautiful and we had a blast. So yeah, I, I'll definitely send you like my in-depth guides, but like overall, you're going to love it. Lovely. I'll put that link in the show notes so people can read that as well. Perfect. Perfect. In this next country, don't worry. Uh, I might have offended you with Bali, but I'm not going to offend you with this one. 
Greece, I love the place. Tell me where you've been in Greece and favorite places. I'll start with the first place I went was Athens. I like, I just needed to check it off the list. It's like the big one. And I wanted to see all the stuff for the Olympics. Yeah. And I just thought that was a really cool thing to experience. Yeah. And then um, I thought Crete was amazing. Oh, nice. Yeah. Like loved it. Um, And I've actually been three times. So we just went back recently in the spring for a hotel collaboration. Oh, and nice. a couple like brand photo shoots that we were yeah. doing. So that was really fun because, you know, that one was kind of most expenses paid and actually Lovely. getting paid. So, yeah. um, but for me, like for Greece, it's, it's the food and the people like other than Bali, Bali's probably number two, but Greek people are just the nicest people I have ever met in my yeah. entire life. And even if they can't speak to you, they are so eager to interact with you and, you know, like help you the amount of food. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we, we will order one thing and we are seven shots in and three desserts, <laughs> and four appetizers and six sides. And it's, it's never on the bill. Like it's just never, yeah, on the bill. you just sit there yeah. and talk and they're just like, here, have this and this and this and this. And you're just sitting there at the end of the meal. Like, honestly, the first few times we went, like after a while, I was like, okay, this is just how it is. I started ordering less food because I wasn't going to be able to eat or drink anything <laughs> because of what they brought me. The hospitality and the generosity just are unparalleled for me so far. Every single time I've been to Greece, they are just amazing. Yeah, magical people. I felt like a local when I was there, but I went in December when no one was there tourist-wise. Mm -hmm. I had this weird feeling. It's a nice feeling that I was the only tourist, so everyone knew who I was for like three or four days because I was the only guy who wasn't good. <laughs> so they like say hello, they welcome me into their calf. I had a little local calf that I spoke to the locals in and it gave me like some breakfast really, really cheap. Like I'm talking mm -hmm. like one or two euros. It probably is like oh yeah, five or 10 in the summer. But even the hire car lady was like, don't worry about security deposit. Just text me if you've got something wrong. You'll be right. I was like, oh, okay. Super chill. Just like, the nicest people, man. Yeah. What a place. And there's loads and loads of islands to go and see so many yeah so many like there's just so many that we haven't been to and we we kind of always talk about you know if we're kind of unsure where we want to go greece tends to pop up a lot just because there's always a new island to visit. yes exactly i thought if you are unsure where to go just pick greece and pick a random island and go and check it out yep can't go wrong okay so i've got here what are some of your favorite traveling experiences that you've done so far so I honestly, I just really love traveling like with my partner and other mm -hmm. friends. And it's kind of one of the beautiful things about this lifestyle is you end up making friends in a lot of different countries. So I truly have friends like across the world in all these different time zones. I just think that's kind of awesome. You can call people up or you can go visit someplace and you always have people to meet up with. And even if you're going to somewhere new, like they can come meet you somewhere. So like, I mean, you know, like I said, my friend who's from New Zealand and I actually met in the States at university, like we met up in Bali and we're talking about trying to go meet up in Thailand. And it's just really great because you may not see them often, but like that type of friendship and that kind of bond that you have is really unique. It's kind of another one of those that you just pick up where you left off or you kind of keep tabs on each other. But, you know, it's always just really exciting because they're always down for an adventure. And that's just kind of like, you know, the great thing about having traveling friends, I think. That's the friends you need. Yep. Yep. For sure. Okay. And I also asked about some of your activities uh, that kind of coincides really. So you listed a few here, quite a lot of animal related activities. Yes. So this is a big, big thing. I am a huge advocate for animal rights and this goes a lot into like my sustainable travel and ethical animal tourism. And this is something I'm actually working on. I'm writing a whole ebook on sustainable travel. And I have a few articles on like ethical animal tourism and all that kind of stuff. And over the next few years, like I'd really like to continue to push, push, push this because it's just something I care about so much. A lot of the times people don't even realize that they're engaging or supporting unethical practices. You know, yes. it, it sometimes it's really hard. Like I, I'll admit I've been to ones where it looked fine online or I thought I had done the research. And then when I showed up, I immediately saw red flags yeah, and had same. to leave. And it mm. just, it, it's such a bummer because like you've spent the money, you were excited for the experience. But then when you see that, like, it's not an ethical place, like you're just like, I can't support this. I can't, you know, go in here and stuff. So yeah, I, I would say that like working with, you know, actual sanctuaries and rehab centers or rescues, that kind of stuff has been really big highlights for me because I still get to have these experiences, but I also get to support companies who are actually trying to push for like animal rehabilitation, animal welfare. 
they're trying to promote people to like learn about the animals and save species who are endangered and stuff like that and I just like I absolutely love those experiences so they're they're very high on my list okay yeah it's great work I think it needs to be out there more yeah I will honestly say that a few years ago like I think what really sparked was the like the dog meat trade and the festival that happens in China and stuff and so uh yeah when I I first heard about it I I I physically just bawled and bawled and bawled and I was just like I think it was just kind of one of those light bulb moments in life where I was just like something affects you that deeply I've just kind of was like okay like what can I do and I think that kind of helped to spur my passion to try to figure out you know like how to do all of this traveling and these things but do it sustainably and ethically yeah I kind of cringe at myself really because I've done one in Thailand this elephant tour you know you sat on the elephant and then also feed the tigers and like looking back like what was I doing can I use the excuse of being young maybe I don't know but looking back it is grim um, when you actually well, and this is my this is my other thing is like I never want to make people feel bad for things because like if you weren't aware like that happens but you have a responsibility going forward to educate yourself and do the yeah. research and yeah. like own up to the fact that you did it like and that's why I, like I, I said that too I've I've been there I've done it I and I've looked back and I'm like you know what I made these mistakes but like I own up to it and now like I've really focused on devoting myself to I always do the research and if somehow it still gets by me if I show up and it's not what it should be leave walk away don't support them yeah great point that one other thing I want to quickly question, four-wheeling in a desert. Where was that? D- Dubai. Oh, yeah. Dubai. Okay, cool. Sand dunes. Yep. Yeah. So go on, like, the dune bashing. I get motion sickness, by the way, so the dune bashing got really intense. <laughs> uh, we sat in the very back seat, which was just the stupidest decision, but we got in, and there was, like, this family, and these kids wanted to, like, go to certain seats, so we offered to move for them um I should have been like "Ooh, yeah made your motion sickness car sickness person but yeah they were excited and you know like my partner is also just like the nicest person like most generous person he'll he'll do he'll give you the shirt off his back like anything to make other people happy so I knew he would have no problem moving for them and I was like all right well I guess we'll get the whole seat to ourselves in the back but no it was a horrible horrible decision even after we got out like I was still nauseous for so long that like I had to sit out when they were sandboarding and stuff so if you oh. get motion sickness sit in the front seat or like in the <laughs> front row of passengers on the way back I sat in the front with a driver uh, oh that here's another thing like the people again so nice like as soon as they saw I was motion sickness had me like with like water bottles and wet towels and AC and up front and were giving me like coconut water to get the, like the electrolytes going like so just so friendly and so nice yeah so dune bashing lots of fun but if you are a motion sick person that like don't sit in the back take motion sickness medicine and like know your limits. Um, but you, but like, there's so many other things you can do. So like we went four wheeling, there's ATVing, you can go sand, like boarding, all that kind of stuff is so much fun. So mm-hmm. anything you can do out in the dunes, do it. it. It's a lot of fun. Okay. Some great tips there. Awesome. Okay. So we're going to move on to sort of like your travel and business stuff now. So we're going to start with your digital nomad life. You've been doing it for Yeah, say the last seven years on and off, right? So how did it start? Well, so the seven years includes when I moved over for my master's, actually. Um, So I I moved over, I was studying, I graduated, I decided I did not want to go back to the States and was starting to look for positions here. So my degree is actually in counseling clinical psychology and Mm -hmm. the Austrian system is completely different, like just very, very different. And it's very difficult to practice the way that I wanted to practice. So I started working at international schools and counseling centers and stuff like that, but I wasn't loving it. Like I was really way more focused on like my traveling and stuff like that. So I actually started my website just as a way for friends and family back home to be able to keep up. You know, I'd get a lot of text messages being like, hey, what are you doing now? And I realized I was answering the same question about 11 times. Yeah, it happens a lot. (laughs) And and I thought, hey, like, what if I just made like a random blog and posted, you know, pictures or something. So I started doing that. Then it turned into a lot of people started asking me about like tips or advice or itineraries or something. And then I was like, oh, okay, well maybe I'll start like writing reviews on the places I go. 
Yeah. So I just started writing reviews and kind of naturally like writing out my itineraries and recommendations and stuff so that I could just kind of send a link over. I wasn't really focused on making that a business at the moment, you know, but then someone kind of introduced me to becoming a travel agent. Okay. Yeah. And I uh, got certified as an independent travel agent and did that for about a year, year and a half. Was doing that simultaneous while I was still working. Mm -hmm. um, but it kind of gave me a different perspective on like how to help people. And I was doing that remotely and everything. So that was kind of nice. And then <laughs> COVID hit. Wow. Yeah. And life got pretty grim. Uh, you know, the <laughs> over overworked, underpaid, couldn't do anything with your life other than work. And the worst part was my partner was actually in a different country. Oh. So he was away for hockey and it made it really, really difficult for us to see each other because I couldn't go visit him. Mm -hmm. He had to come visit me. And at that point, I think we had been living apart for two and a half years. And I kind oh, wow. of was just like, yeah, like we were back and forth and we had off season together and stuff like that. But it, it was just a lot after that. And I kind of got to the point, especially during COVID, where I was just like, this is too much. I really want us to be in the same place, but he moves around a lot. And for me, I was just like, oof, uh, trying to find a new job in all these different places is going to be really tiring. And I had a coworker at the time who actually was just like, have you ever thought about like monetizing your website? And you could kind of like push your travel agency and stuff like that. Yeah. And I was like, oh, you know, like this is a good idea. So while I was finishing up my contract in the school, I started actually studying how to like work on my website and what kind of things I'd like to do there. And the universe just kind of gave me a little bit of a helping hand actually and had some brands reach out to me and wanted me to shoot content for them because they had seen stuff that I was just posting naturally on my website and on my social media. And they're like, hey, would you like to come and like write a review for us on your website? Or, Hey, could you come and post some pictures on your social media and then like maybe take some for us to use on our website? So I kind of got the content creation reverse way. A lot of people, you know, yes. like they're like, Oh, that looks cool. Yeah. I actually had it happen completely backwards. <laughs> they kind of reached out to me and I was just like, Oh my gosh, I have no idea what I'm doing, but this yeah. sounds like fun. We'll yeah. give it a shot. And so after those first few I, I was hooked. I loved it. I mean, um, my dad was a photographer. I love photography. I'm already doing a lot of this for places that I'm traveling. So it kind of mm. just became learning a bit of different content creation. So then I took uh, courses to help improve my photography skills, videography skills, editing skills. And then it really became, I needed to learn how to actually like do it the way other people are doing it, where you pitch to people and you seek people out. So had to learn how to, you know, research and find people I wanted to work with and then pitch and then um, negotiate and write contracts and have rates and all of that fun stuff that came along with it. So yeah, so that was a that was a big learning curve as well, actually, and took a while to kind of get into uh, all of, like the nitty gritty behind the scenes of yeah. content creation that people don't really realize you have to do. But that also gave me something that I could do from anywhere. You yeah, know, yeah. so working on my blog as a travel agent and content creation, I could do it anywhere. So I could mm -hmm. move with my partner. And so for the next year and a half of doing that, that's kind of what I was doing while I was moving with him. Then I had a lot of people kind of start reaching out to me once they saw that I was working with brands and hotels and stuff like that. Just being like, how are you doing this? How are you doing this? It was kind of similar to the website creation. I just <laughs> realized that I was having enough of these things that I was just like, how can I make this easier for them and myself? Okay, what if I make like a course? So I thought about making a course on like yeah. how I did all of this. And honestly, one of the things that I realized was the main goal of these people was to become location independent, was to become kind of a digital yeah. nomad. Like mm -hmm. it wasn't just about the content creation or anything like that. They were like, how are you traveling so much? How are you making a living while you're on the road? Mm -hmm. So for me, it was, it made a lot more sense to focus on, you know, the digital nomad and how people can do that. So I sat down and created a course basically that helps people from start to finish from zero all the way to full-time nomadic lifestyle. And I do it step by step with them. So it's not just a course. I also am a one-on-one -on -one coach and I go with them step by step. Every single student of mine gets, you know, one-on-one -on -one help and personalized plans. You know, like they go through the course like everybody else, but mm -hmm. each one has, you know, very specific things that is, you know, yeah. it's very 
personal and individualistic to them. And I absolutely loved it. Like, I just like, I can't even express how much I love this part of my job. And it's kind of been my baby. So don't get me wrong. I love content creation. I absolutely love all of those scripts <laughs> and stuff. But you know, when I created a course and I watched other people come back to me and they're like, yeah, this yeah. has changed my life. Like I'm having the freedom to do this. Like this course is amazing. And just seeing how happy they are because I know how unhappy I was when I had to work in a place that I felt undervalued. I felt underpaid. I felt overworked. I felt you know, restricted me in so many ways and having the freedom to be like, Hey, I need to go to the grocery store or I would like to work out or I need a doctor's appointment. And I, I don't want to have to ask permission to do these daily necessities mm, or, yeah. you know, like I had a coworker who had a family emergency and had to fly back to the States and could stay for a grand total of like 48 hours because oh, that's how much time they had. Like, I just like, I think that was another really big like point for me that I'm not okay with not having permission to do the necessary yeah. things of my life. And I just truly don't understand the work until you're 65. Like who wants to go skydiving and bungee jumping and are <laughs> being in the desert at 65 years old? Like more exactly. power to them than they are. <laughs> like, you know what? If there are some 65 year olds out there doing this i mean that's a fact you might not make it so and that's true too you know but like honestly i i just don't know if whether you make it if you make it like i really hope you guys do but like if you make it like are you really going to be wanting to do these things at 65 and exactly. the quality of life is now like the time to do all of this is now and i can always go back and do other more normal traditional roles if i have to later in life i mean like sure maybe i'll be what other people consider a little bit behind the curve but I will never get this time back mm -hmm. and for me this is when I want to live my life and I've just never been happier than I am doing this I just I couldn't imagine going back honestly and it's amazing that you're helping people with the academy I'll grab the link and put that in the show notes for sure and that's linked to your website isn't it travel munches mm -hmm. yep yeah so that has everything from your academy I guess your blogs are on there your social media contacts, um, all that, and maybe contact form as well. Yep. Um, is there anything else that we should know about on that website? Um, so I have obviously like my actual website, but I have a, like a landing page website actually yeah, yeah. that I send to yeah. people. And that's the one that has, it has my, like my, yeah, my Calendly, if you want to, you know, schedule a call so we can kind of, I always like to schedule a call with people before we get into the Academy. So I can kind of yeah. really get the perspective of what, they specifically need because everybody's journey is obviously quite mm -hmm. different and I really like to get a feel for that kind of before we get started so you know or if they just kind of want to be like hey I'm not entirely sure maybe we get on a call kind of a thing so I have my call I have my website with all of my articles and resources mm -hmm. um, I have my portfolios for brands hotels that kind of a thing I have all of my socials linked yeah so that's all kind of on one landing page I'm gonna put links in the show notes for that uh, some quick five questions, some of the highs and lows of that lifestyle, digital nomading. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I talk about these in the academy as well, because I always value transparency and I really yeah. want to be realistic with people. It's not all sunshine and rainbows every day. Like, don't get me wrong. There are a lot of benefits, but everything in life comes with challenges. And one of the things we talked about earlier was a bit of loneliness. Um, yeah. of, of course you make friends and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to have friends all over the world, but you're constantly moving. So it is really hard to maintain long, long-term friendships that are, you know, really true deep connections. Um, and like I said, you know, you're going to miss out on things back home, like the amount of engagements, weddings, bridal showers, babies being born that I have missed. Yeah. It, it's, it's sad. Like it's really sad to miss all of that. Um, so like, I truly try not to take for granted the time that I am home and I get to see people and spend it with them. You know, at the end of the day, like this is what it kind of costs to have this lifestyle. And for now, the benefits outweigh that. Um, mm -hmm. But it is something that you're going to struggle with. Like you're, you're going to struggle with loneliness. So I have a lot of resources to kind of help people fight off that and try to, you know, deal with that because it is something you're going to face. It's something that's going to kind of come back, but there are ways that you can combat it. But you have flexibility. So if you have to go home, you can. Exactly. That's a key point. I think being oh, location yeah. independent is one of the highest things you can achieve because all you need is internet. And that's pretty much across the world there. 
to an extent. Yep. If there's ever a reason that I have to go home, I can go home and it's not going to completely disrupt my life anymore. Like it would have, you know, like I'm not going to face losing my job. Like I, we were, we were actually threatened to lose our jobs if we went home for the holidays or something during COVID times. And yeah, like, yeah, that, I think that was another part of my like breaking point. <laughs> Do you know what I don't understand? There's someone making that decision. I'm like, why are they not thinking? Yeah, this sounds a bit shit. <laughs> like, why are they not thinking that? Well, and for me, it's just, you know, oh, it was just mind boggling to watch like what my colleague had to go through just to go home to like, yeah. for a family emergency. And yeah, I think that was a really big one for me where I was just like, no, something's got to give because I can't live my life just always constantly worried. Like, am I going to get fired? Am I going to lose this? Like, do I, do I have to make the decision between being able to pay my rent and eat or, you know, being able to go home and see a family member who needs exactly. me to be there? Like nobody should ever have to make that decision. No, dictated to by a person and or company. Nah, mm -hmm. it's not for me either. I'm kind of on the journey of trying to figure that out too. Like how, how can I make an income on the road? That's kind of the journey I'm on now. Also, I want to very quickly touch on, you also blog about sustainable travel. Already mentioned it a little bit previously. What is sustainable travel? Because the reason I asked that, I went to a panel a few months ago about Pakistan travel. That question came up about traveling to Pakistan. How can they make it sustainable? And I said this before on a podcast, this guy just went first and said, well, you can't. <laughs> because if you want sustainable travel, you just don't do it. I was like, oh, I see where, he I see where he's coming from. He's a nature photographer. So he's like, well, we shouldn't be there. But like, realistically, people want to travel. So I'm like, oh, where's the middle ground? Um, I have how, a how quote do you see about it? this in my ebook, actually. Oh, yeah. I, I have a whole section about people who just straight up say like, you just shouldn't travel. And I'll play the devil's advocate where, yes, I can understand their point. Mm. Um, but you also have to think about the fact that a lot of places actually rely on tourism. Yeah. Like, that's where all of their money comes from. So if tourism just completely stopped, these places wouldn't survive. Locals would actually suffer. Exactly. So cutting tourism out completely is actually not the not the solution because huge populations in the world truly like tourism is one of the top three industries in so many different countries that mm -hmm. it's just not feasible. It's not realistic. And in the end, it actually wouldn't help. So mm -hmm. there's there's a lot of definitions and different ways that people describe it. Uh, however, the basic premise is that it means to leave behind a positive impact. You have a smaller energy footprint and you influence progressive change before, during, and after your travels in the environment, culture, and location. Mm. So focus on what you can do to help those people. Um, you know, like some of the things that I always talk about is support local businesses, you know, find a local restaurant, find the local stalls, the market, uh, you know, just that kind of thing. Don't go to the big chain restaurants. Don't stay in the big hotels. If there are tour options, a lot of times you can see that there are ones done by huge corporate businesses or ones done by local businesses. Yeah. Always choose the local business. Go to the market for food. Go like, you know, you see vendors on streets by beaches a lot of times. Like those are just locals. Go to them. I try not to get really souvenirs. I do have a personal collection of tiny elephant figurines that I collect in <laughs> all different countries. Yeah. Um, but I've never bought them in like a souvenir shop. I've gotten them oh, at okay. local stores or markets yeah, yeah. or like handcrafted ones from people. Like I have some hand glass, like hand blown glass ones that are incredible. I have stone ones that were carved, wooden ones that were carved, you know, um, mm. and they're just so unique. I have wax ones that were made into a candle and stuff like that. Um, but they've all been bought from locals at markets, stalls, vendors, that kind of a thing. Never from like a big souvenir shop. Do your research on ethical tourism. Like I was talking about earlier, like all of your tours or excursions, see what type of practices they are. Not just if it's animals involved, you know, see if they're paying, especially if locals are employed, like see if they're paying them fairly, see where yeah. the wages are going, see. And like a lot of this stuff you can actually find online, like companies have to report a lot of this. Mm -hmm. So. I get it takes up time and I get it's, you know, not the most fun thing to research, but you can usually find a lot of the basis and you don't have to spend that much time on each one to kind of get a feel like once you start doing it, you're going to start noticing like what's good and what's not. And it'll start becoming a lot quicker. Um, and my biggest tip is to like, look out for greenwashing. Yeah. Becoming sustainable and eco-friendly is kind of a fad or a trend and while I'm happy it's getting more attention and publicity, like the people who are going to abuse it are greenwashing and they're trying to say that they are eco-friendly or yeah. they're sustainable practices when they're actually not. So this is why it's so important to actually educate yourself on what to look for, because then you're going to be able to see, yes, they are actually 
practicing what they're preaching or they're just saying they're doing this but it's not actually very ethical got it and you cover all this on your blogs don't you um on your a website. lot of this so i'm kind of revamping the sustainable part of my website because i wanted to update a lot of these as i'm actually writing my ebook as well um so i, I still have a few posts out there but a lot of them are getting edited at the moment so over the okay. next like a couple weeks even months more and more are going to be coming out so keep an eye out for those because I'm, I'm working on a lot of those while i'm simultaneously trying to finish up my ebook okay and i will put links in the show notes but can you just remind people where can people find you on your websites and social medias yep so my website is www.travelmunters.com and sustainability is actually one of the main like menus at the top and you can go in and i'm going to have different like subsections one of them is sustainable brands uh so this is another big thing that i work with a lot of the brands that i partner with um i only work with brands for promotion that share my values yeah and it's a lot of you know they're using products that are locally sourced uh recycled materials you know like green processing uh paying locals proper wages all of that kind of stuff that's what i really work with and promote on my site so anybody that I promote on my site, you can already know that it's guaranteed to be an ethical That's great. brand. I'm working on a section for like eco hotels. Oh, nice. Yep, yeah. Because that's one of the big ones that a lot of people tend to do a little bit of the greenwashing. So that's a section that's coming out soon. I'm going to work on a collection of sustainable tourism that not just I have done personally, but I'm reaching out to other people who have done their research as well and kind of trying to get like a big database for that so that you can kind of check and see like, hey, I'm going to this place and I'd like to do it. And you can kind of check on there and see maybe what companies are, you know, actually doing the right things. Mm -hmm. um, and then just, you know, your average regular tips on how you can be a more sustainable traveler. So all of that's going to be on my website under the sustainability tab. That's brilliant. That's fantastic. I think this is an area that needs to be half investigated but half put out there as well and it's an important subject i'm glad you're doing that because i think there's actually not enough people doing it um so that's great for you because i think you'll get a bit of traction for that i think i think it's a really um like you can you can find people who are doing it who are definitely experts and have been doing it way longer than i have but i just mm -hmm. feel like it's only now kind of being brought into the light so not as many people yeah. know about it or know where to find it Mm -hmm. um so that that's also another one of my goals is try to find a lot of those experts and also help bring their stuff to the light because you know they've been doing it for a long long time so i want to make sure that their knowledge is also shared and i mean like everything else like it's always going to be changing it's always going to be kind of growing so like it's gonna we're gonna have to keep updating our own yes, knowledge and our own resources yeah. So like, this is never, it's never going to end really on the information that we're going to get. and We're going to have to constantly update it, mm -hmm. but it's something that I care about so much. And I think it's such an important mission that like, I'm happy to kind of keep working on it. No, no. Fantastic work. Yeah. I'm glad you're doing it. That's awesome. So we're going to finish the episode with my quick fire travel questions. These are normally Let's random and uh, kind of just made up on the spot. The first one is going to be, Hey, yeah. Just a quick one. I just want to say there are many ways to support this podcast. You can buy me a coffee and help support the podcast with $5. Or you can go to my merch store with the affiliate link with T Public, where there's plenty of merch available to buy, such as T-shirts, jumpers, hoodies, and also some children's clothing. Thirdly, which is free, you can also rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser, or Good Pods. Also, you can find me on social media on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. Simply just search for Winging It Travel Podcast and you'll find me displaying all my social media content for traveling, podcast, and other stuff. Thank you. It's travel question time. How many countries have you traveled to? Oh my gosh, I have no idea. Like, I have a map on my website where they're colored in, like, <laughs> in, the, in the 20 something. Like, okay. I know the cities are close to 200. So, like, that's another mm -hmm. thing is, like, we try to go to as much as we can in a country. So, we've probably been to Italy 12 times. We've probably been to Greece oh, six times. We've yeah, probably yeah. been to Spain eight times. So, um, we, we tend to kind of go back a lot of the times, mm. especially depending on where we're located. Uh, it's my goal to always try to go to like one or two new places in a year, but 
a lot of the times, depending on where hockey season is, we are closer to a country, you know, so like this year we went to Italy quite a few yeah. times because we're so close to it. My partner and I actually realized that the first like five times we traveled together or no, sorry, like the first like six times we traveled together, five of them were to Spain and we didn't even notice. <laughs> like We just kept going back. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I would say high 20s for the countries, but like over 200 something cities within those so like we we kind of go back to a lot of them um i'm knocking off three new ones this year though so i'm really excited about that that's one of my questions so hold fire okay uh, okay <laughs> three of the countries that you mentioned the, the late 20s what three are your favorites indonesia hands down top my favorite yeah the uae and greece are pretty up there yeah like oh okay I, right I, like, yeah i <sighs> I mean, like, okay, I, I, I like Russia. I adore Italy. Obviously, we've gone to Spain so many times. Um, but no, I, I think I'd stick with those three as my top three, actually. Okay, interesting. Sometimes people pick them just because they've got different experiences, but maybe not the favorite overall. But okay, that's yeah. cool. No, Indonesia's number one. Always will be number one. I, I would be shocked. To be fair, though, if anything is going to happen, it's going to be this year at one of the three that may dethrone it, but we'll see. Well, next question is, three countries that you've not traveled to that is next on your hit list so you can go amazing okay so i'm going to zanzibar and tanzania in three weeks yeah uh i have a friend who's opening her airbnb and i'm doing a couple hotel collaborations with black, uh, brand collaborations while i'm there yeah so that's number one and i'm so excited um i think it's a strong contender <laughs> <laughs> um Number two is we're going to Madeira, the island oh, of Portugal, Portugal that's, yeah. you know, closer down to Africa. Mm -hmm. um, also, I think just a really, really strong contender. Um, and that's going to be like kind of the big trip with my partner this year. So I think that's another reason that I'm really looking forward to that one. And then for my birthday in November, we're going to Mexico. I'm going to go to uh, Cancun and Tulum. Yeah. And I've always wanted to go there. I mean, like, I get it's quite touristy now, but also it's one of the largest digital nomad hubs. And I it would is, really, yeah. really like to go and just work on so much digital nomad connections, networking, content creation for that. And like try to reach as many people as I can and meet a bunch of people there. Cause I'd like to actually do some interviews with other digital nomads as well mm -hmm. uh, for my site and kind of get all of their information and try to kind of, you know, build that network and database for them as well so yeah i think that one will also be great and i'm going with my parents which is really special because it's a big birthday and it's just going to be me and them and only child i'm very very close with my parents so oh, okay. I'm, I'm yeah pretty, yeah i'm i'm pretty excited to go on this <laughs> <trip>. <laughs> so those are my three big ones this year yeah. that i'm really excited for they're great three okay and i know from your website name that you're a big foodie so three international cuisines that are your favorites oh okay um number one is probably russian food which is so like wow unique yeah i love it i mean like the russian dumplings they have uh this like cheese thing that's called saniki which is delicious uh like borscht i i love russian food and mm -hmm. i think i think i had a very privileged exposure to it i uh i dated a ukrainian whose family was all in oh. russia and i had yeah. the opportunity to go to crimea we were on a yacht i don't know how to say this any other way but we were on a yacht. <laughs> and um they had like personal chefs so the food right. that i was exposed to was obviously just like top notch and i think i just fell madly in love with it and then when we were back in moscow like all the restaurants it was incredible food and then I had quite a few Russian friends in Vienna, Austria as well. And, you know, like their families would cook food. And there was one restaurant in Vienna. And since then it's closed down. And I'm so sad because I wish I could recommend it to people, but it's not, it's not there anymore. But I think just having a lot of Russian friends whose family cooked as well, I just, mm -hmm. I got like the authentic cooking. So I just, I fell in love with Russian food. I got to say it's delicious. Okay. And two and three. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, I hate this question because I love food so much. <laughs> okay. I cannot pronounce them, but the donut balls that you get in Greece. Oh yeah. I don't know what the name is for that, but yeah, I can visualize I, them. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's like a fried donut ball yeah. and they have all the different ones and there's like a lemon one, a cinnamon one, a sugar mm -hmm. one, uh, like all these things. Those were just also amazing. I know ne I never had one that wasn't delicious yeah. and I'm, I like sweets, but like, 
it's pretty impressive when the suite can actually rank high on my list mm -hmm. just because for me like really impressive food always tends to be savory savory I'm not yeah, sure. yeah yeah I'm, I'm not yeah. sure why but it just is uh but those things are just out of this world incredible so yeah I would say that's probably number two pick it pick a country oh okay I mean I love all Asian food but like fresh like fresh fresh um like fish that I had there whole I, I don't know the fish I wish I knew the fish that was the biggest problem yeah I, cu I couldn't like I couldn't tell you what it was because I can't read the names and like <laughs> when they were trying to explain it they didn't know the English name for it so it was just one of the most delicious fish I've ever had in my life and like all the seafood there so like I like squid and octopus and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff so I'm I'm very pro seafood and my partner unfortunately is not it's more rare that I get to eat it now, but if we if we make it back over to Asia, he's he's gonna have to try some because oh, the quality over there is just oh, and it's fresh. All the food's exactly. fresh. It's incredible. So good. What an area. Okay, a few more questions. What about a best beach that you've been to? Oh, there was one in Greece that I absolutely loved. It was actually Crete. Uh, mm. It's called Vi Beach, and it's like one of the only natural palm tree reserves. Oh, and they also wow. have like big cliffs that you can walk up and so you get like all of the views but then huh. like down on it yeah um I, I think that's probably one of the best ones I've been to so far sounds incredible um, I'm really looking forward to going to Madeira though because of the black sand beaches I have yes. not made it to a black sand beach yet and I'm dying to mm. um and then I also want to go to the pink beaches so I haven't made it to a pink beach either so those are two big things that I'm like actually really really excited for and I'm going to cross the black sand beaches off this year um nice. so maybe ask me in five months if my answer will change <laughs> okay no worries okay do you drink coffee love coffee okay so you can pick one city in the world to drink the coffee and watch the world go by where are you going to sit well that's two different questions because it's based on coffee and a view ah interesting i normally separate them out but people get a bit weirded out so i combine them now but you can answer different for the actual coffee and the view I think I'm going to have to go with Italy for the coffee. Yeah. It's, it's I, a really just, uh, I really love Italian coffee. Like the, the amount of times that I've woken up with my, and my partner does not drink coffee. He, Oh, what? Yeah, like, hate wow. he does not. No yeah. fish, no coffee. Um, Crikey. I know. I know. <laughs> He's got a lot of benefits. I keep him around for reasons. I promise. But, um, <laughs> no, I, I think like, the amount of times that I've like woken up in the morning and had coffee and I'm like, Oh God bless the Italians yeah. after I've had like my first yeah. sip of coffee. I, I don't think I've ever said that so many times for <laughs> any other country after drinking coffee. So I think I'm going to have to go with Italy for the coffee because great answer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really do. I just had that first sip and it's just a natural reaction is God bless the Italians. The view that's, mm. that's a completely, that's a completely different answer. I like, nature views um yeah. so i'd probably go some somewhere like thailand or indonesia um i know what would be my answer i just haven't made it there yet it oh, would be on. new zealand yeah it, it would be new zealand um oh, yeah. new zealand is where i'm fully convinced that i'm actually going to end up when i finally settle down in life i don't know why it's just been that way for the last decade at least where i just have this strong calling that that's where i'm going to end up and be mm. one day and I think I'm kind of putting it off actually because I know when I go, <laughs> I'm just not going to leave. Uh, yeah. And my dream house is a hobbit hole. So like, it's oh, tough. It's I tough. went there and I had no idea what was going on because I'd never seen it. My government was like, you're wasted here. I'm like, yeah, I'll just come along and just look at it. <laughs> there you go. Let, let me pick my jaw off the floor <laughs> really fast. Um, well, this but New Zealand is amazing. really well. <laughs> We were friends. Um, yeah. I, I, I forgave you for the Bali, but I'm not entirely sure about this one. Yeah, I had <sighs> no idea. And that Hobbiton pub, I have no idea what it even means, but I had a drink in there. So there you go. <sighs> Sorry. I, I don't have a response that's nice for... But I, I can respond. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you're right, because I used to live there for a year, and I think it is a magical place. There's this one downside for me. The only downside to it, it's too far. Like from UK, it is the other side of the world. It's just, it's a thirty-hour trip to get back. It's just a, uh, a terrible yeah, nightmare. It's 
it's like 26 I think for my parents as well but the thing is that my dad I think has the same passion like and that if I moved he would move oh okay I'm only child they're they've both been retired for years you like take him with you god dream yeah so I I think that's one of the few places that I actually would stand a chance that if I'm like hey guys I'm moving to New Zealand that my mm. dad would have his bags packed within the next 48 hours and be like, cool, we're selling the house and we'll see you there. Like, I think it's probably one of the only places that that would happen. Fingers crossed that you know, it. one day, one day I end up in New Zealand and parents come with me. <laughs> yeah. Get that camper van out and get driving around. There's no one on the uh, roads. This is dream. the other thing is like, I have this dream to build a, I don't know if you know, a Vario. It's, mercedes it's a very boxy but larger yeah. scaled old school uh that's that is my dream car I, like i laugh because everyone's like what's your dream car and i'm like <laughs> mario like <laughs> yeah i guess super sexy but like that's that's my dream home on wheels um and driving around like new zealand or even australia as well in oh, that, yeah. i think would just be mm. like the absolute dream so one day i hope yeah you won't regret that okay and I'm going to finish the episode with my always question at the end is a few lines as to why someone should make the leap to like a digital nomad lifestyle and go and travel and work at the same time. I think I'm just going to kind of reiterate some of the points that I already said, you know, like mm -hmm. it's a great big world out there and there are some incredible people, amazing cultures, fantastic experiences. Um, like the quote, you know, if, you don't travel you only read one page is just yeah. such a true thing for me mm -hmm. and I just feel like I don't want to let the world pass me by so for me travel is just travel is my life it's it's what makes life life you know it's mm. it's for me it's living that is what makes it living for me but being able to work remotely and doing it while traveling gives you that both like freedom and flexibility, but also stability at the same time. You know, like I, I can travel with my partner wherever he needs to go for his hockey season. I can go on vacation anytime I want and not have to completely take time off from work. I don't have to ask permission from anyone else. And anytime I need to, or just want to go home and see my family, I have that freedom as well. So for me, it's, it really comes down to freedom flexibility and just truly living my life you know the way that for me is fulfilling and and I, I completely understand that everybody has different ways to feel fulfilled but for me there's just nothing better yet than having these new experiences meeting these new people and really trying to just see as much of the beautiful beautiful world that we live in yeah I could not agree more and that's why I quit my job and went traveling there you go okay Buddy, quit your job. Yeah, just quit your job. Just go and do it. <laughs> just do it. <laughs> yeah, just, just do, do it. it. We're going to steal Nike's slogan. <laughs> Someone almost said that as their answer. Yeah, he just said, just fuck your job off and do it. That's all he said. We're going to finish the episode. Thanks so much, Bree, for coming on. It's been a great chat. I've learned a lot. Thanks for making time. And I can't wait to share this episode, but also all your content and links in the show notes, because I think people are going to really benefit from that. Oh, well, thank you. It was an absolute pleasure, and I really appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to my Winging It Travel podcast episode today. You can find me on Instagram at James Hammond Travel or Winging It Travel podcast. You can search for both. I release weekly clips of this podcast episode as well as photos from the last eight to ten years of my travels. You can also follow me on TikTok, Facebook and Pinterest by searching Winging It Travel podcast. I do release daily content to do with travel and the podcast throughout the week. Also check out my website, jameshammond.org. There's content about myself, my travels, and there's also a newsletter sign up as well as a contact form. Finally, please rate and review the podcast on Podchaser. This is my platform of choice. Alternatively, you can rate this on Apple or wherever you get your podcasts from. This really helps the podcast gain a bit of traction for the future in terms of guests and content. And I'm glad to see that you guys are listening out there, reviewing it and enjoying the content so far. Stay safe, stay humble, keep listening, keep traveling and I'll catch you soon. Cheers, James.